pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Once again, thank you for coming on a beautiful Tuesday evening. Uh, before we get started, I would like to, uh, the board member, our board candidates that are in the room, if you want to introduce yourself. Go ahead, Dolores. Dolores Howard. Jane Bates. <laughs> I always forget Jane. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Chesterfield, Missouri. We provide project management services primarily to public and private schools. Um, here tonight with uh, Craig Lindquist, our president, uh, and Lloyd Poker, one of our field people. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight and look forward to it. Thank you. <coughs> Paul? Paul Rockmiller, Rockmiller Instruction, is going to talk about general construction. Uh, brought Bill DC uh, and Kyle Rogers from uh, my office with me. Okay. Um, Format tonight is starting with uh, Mr. Decker, <coughs> and each group will have 15 minutes to speak, and then we'll have a 15 minutes uh, question and answer session. I'll just turn the time over to you. Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, uh, like I said, um, we're a cooperative trust that try to add value to our iron, iron worker service, so similar to the other building trades. And, uh, Um, the first thing I'll start about is uh, safety. Uh, that's our number one priority is safety. No injuries on the job. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a safety and health roundtable that meets twice a year. And we meet with uh, the Department of Labor since it is it's, uh, you know, in June and uh, December. Uh, National, we meet with the National Association of Reinforcing Steel Contractor Association, National Association of Metal Ornamental Contractors, Specialized Riggers and Rigging Association, <coughs> National Ornamental and Miscellaneous Metals Association, Concrete Reinforcing Steel Institute, the Center for Construction Research and Training, and the Pre-Stress Concrete Institute along with the American Institute of Steel Construction and the Associated General Contractor Association with the Department of Labor and, and OSHA. And we get together and try and uh, see where uh, we can make improvements, where we can maintain safety, where we can, you know, be uh, at the top shelf with uh, no uh, no certified uh, accidents, uh, recordables, if you will, and do everything we can to bring all the parties uh, that look oversee these different parts of the industry, uh, take care of uh, what the industry needs and, and do it in the most productive, workmanlike manner at the at the safest possible uh, safest possible way. 
we have a safety and health department. That department is in charge of taking the information from the round table we have, and like I say, it's a national thing. We drive that message down to our members through social, social media, uh, Twitter, uh, uh, Facebook, email, um, uh, e-blast, and uh, newsletter, paper newsletter that comes out monthly. Uh, our entire workforce, the iron workers in St. Louis, uh, are uh, trained. Our apprenticeship is four years. Uh, entire wor iron worker workforce in Local 396 has OSHA subpart R training. And uh, OSHA subpart R training is basically an overview of steel erection, uh, multi-story buildings, bridges, all the type of work we do, and a basic safety overview of uh, what workers can be prepared for when they, when they go on a job site. Our entire iron worker workforce has a minimum of OSHA 10. Now, our, our apprentices, uh, like I say, get OSHA 10 and subpart R before they ever go to work, before they ever start. Uh, on August the 8th of 2008, our whole membership, 1,700 workers, had a minimum of OSHA 10. Uh, all our apprentices that complete their four-year apprenticeship will graduate with an OSHA 30 card, which is the next step up in a lot of places, uh, say, uh, uh, heavy and highway plants, uh, power plants and so forth, you have to have an OSHA 30 to be a foreman. And the OSHA 30 certification, there's still a lot of our journeymen that also have gone back and, and taken care of that upgrade. Uh, the National Training Fund is under the supervision impact. Uh, five years ago, we had 40-year-old materials. Uh, impact is, a, is, is eight years old. And in the last five years, we've developed uh, cutting edge technology for our classroom training. Uh, and you can see all the courses that are listed up there. And, and uh, we have the guy that's ahead of our education department is a PhD from John Hopkins University that actually works for the Iron Worker International. And he designs and details all the <coughs> school books and curriculum. Um, and it covers uh, quite a bit of subject matter. We also train our teachers once a year in Michigan. They go for upgrades and teaching certificates of different types to uh, train the trainer and teach different subject matter like uh, welding and so forth, which I'll get to shortly right here. Uh, we also have an iron apprentice competition that we have every two years, uh, national competition to take the best apprentices we have and have a contest. And also they're given a leadership course uh, in, that, in that session. Uh, North, North America, uh, we have a lot, uh, 13 reef drill advisory boards, and the reason I've got this slide in here is uh, uh, they're broken up their regions, and Canada, it just came on board now, so the United States and Canada, we have 175 training facilities teaching a core curriculum, so if you get iron workers in the east coast, west coast, in between Canada, they're being attained, uh, trained in the same subject matter. Uh, all of them everywhere. So if you get an iron worker in St. Louis or, or New Jersey, they're going to be trained with the same materials. Welding certification program. All our iron workers that uh, we have about a 95% uh, certification coming out of our apprentice school. We have two AWS certified trainers at our facility. Uh, that and and to uh, like I say this uh, this thing about adding value to our services for the con our contractors uh, every six months the apprentice and our journeyman can turn their book in uh, what they've been welding and get that recertified we take care of all the cost of recertifying the member uh, if the, if uh, you know and that keeps the guy trained and the certifications up to date <coughs> that the contractor doesn't have to spend time and money taking care of his employee iron worker employees. Reinforcing department, we have several uh, certification, post-tensing certifications uh, that our, our apprentices graduate with those skills and certifications. And uh, we also, uh, anything that we can help in the way of uh, organizing uh, reinforcing groups in the United States and what, what is new, what is the best technology to use, uh, we try and put that out and get that, drive that down to our membership. Iron workers farming training. We have a training class for our anybody that graduates from our apprenticeship wants to be a foreman. Uh, this particular program got a, a national award from the AISC, that's American Institute of Skill Construction, and from CURT, which is a construction users roundtable. 
In the, in the case of the Construction Union Roundtable, they take in all kinds of contractors all over the United States, union and non-union. We got a national award for this, uh, the Farm and Pocket Guide and the Farm and Training. And we just rolled out uh, about a month ago a superintendent class and a, and a uh, general foreman class for iron workers uh, to certify them to, uh, you know, educate them uh, to be supervisors for our, our employers and, uh, you know, take, because that's one of the big, big, big parts of this is having people able to take responsibility and be a supervisor and run other iron workers. There, there's, uh, we, we got the award from Kurt. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the FMI Institute. That's the uh, Fales Management Institute. Uh, it's nationally known for leadership courses. We have three classes designed at a begi uh, beginner's level, uh, mid-range level, and and this one is just, uh, we just ran our pilot course is coming out next week. It's a three-day seminar for leadership skills, and that's to our project managers, iron worker superintendents, iron worker officers, and so forth. Uh, and it doesn't have any cost to it. None of these actually, this is all included in the cost of impact uh, provided services that the iron worker puts out uh, to, like I say, add value to our services. Green construction for iron workers. Our iron workers are taught about green construction. They understand what green construction is. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have special skills. It's the uh, same skill set that we have when we uh, build buildings all over the place. But it is an awareness and, and that we have got, and uh, our apprentices, uh, every apprentice goes through this course. Training for fabrication and shop iron workers. We also have rolled out training classes for our shops, fabrication shops that uh, employ iron workers. Uh, and all these classes are, uh, you know, in, included in the cost of impact. So our contractors, we can, they can get a cafe style training at their shops. If they want a course or two, we can set up an apprenticeship program, a shop apprenticeship program for the shops. And uh, we've done that down in Florida. Uh, Al Barisi here has had some training from us in his city uh, on just specific classes. And, and some of their employees had helped, um, you know, put together the textbook and the, some of the work projects uh, that are uh, in, in, this, in these courses. Um, I'd also tell you that we've just also are working on a supervisor. It's called a lead man uh, certification for shops. It's the same thing as being a foreman. And then finally, uh, drug testing. Uh, we have 70,000 iron workers in our, in our national database all over the United States uh, that's accepted you know, pretty far and wide. Uh, we have a 100% drug-free workforce. A uh, guy that's in the database here can go to California and work. They look him up. He can go to work there. He can go to work anywhere in the country. And uh, that, it, that whole part of it is taken care of by impact. And that, that too is included in our services. There is no charge to the contractor except within the you know, iron worker price, price frame. But uh, the, the actual database and everything, what, the impact takes care of the whole thing. And uh, we don't have anybody that goes to work as drug tested. So I wanted to keep it short. I know that I was on 15 minutes and then there was maybe some questions or answers. Uh, if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. Anybody? Okay. Well, I really appreciate your time and let me let, allow me to come here and speak tonight. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to uh, CTS group. Yes. <coughs> Safely. I didn't want to yeah, you're all good. You're already up. You got a fine stretch? I already got it out. I got oh, my guess. Oh, okay.
That's pretty neat. That's in Arkansas. That's pretty nice. Good evening. I'm uh, Vince Throckmorton with CTS Group, and my apologies because I failed to mention that, uh, and I overlooked this, but the owner of our company is here, Scott Rowery, with me this evening, so sorry I forgot to mention you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it personal. <laughs> I'm just here to try to um, explain the generalities of performance contracting, and so this is probably the first time that I've done this where I wasn't also pitching people on CTS, so... Just give me a funny look if I go a little bit overboard, but I'm going to try to keep it generic. Um, what is performance contracting? Um, this is kind of the agenda that I brought. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about construction industry trends, um, some project study results, the advantages of performance design build, um, the proposition kids and how you all have laid it out so far, um, proven results and path forward. Um, performance contracting is a form of design build, um, and as everybody knows what design build is. It has an energy savings focus. Uh, that's one of the primary focuses when we are doing performance contracting is looking at ways to save the energy long term. Um, it's performed by energy service companies, which are classified as ESCOs, um, where Many of us are members of the National Association, ASCO, of energy service contractors. It's kind of like an accreditation program that we go through. Basically, it's like a license. Um, it's regulated by Missouri state law, which I just passed a copy. Did everybody get one of those? Um, so it's something that's it's a relatively new law and a relatively new <coughs> method of construction. The law was enacted in the state of Missouri in 1997. Um, Scott and one of our partners were actually some of the people that helped write this, this performance contracting statute. Um, it guarantees energy savings over a 15, 10 to 15 year period. So you have long term energy savings that are guaranteed over the course of the, you know, once the construction is completed, that's something that's ongoing. Um, along with the reduced energy cost is re reduced maintenance costs. And they use the example that if you have a 1985 car or a new 2011, typically that, that newer car is going to get a lot less maintenance performed on it than an older one is. It's kind of part of the program. Um, and long-term operational savings by the energy savings and the guarantee that's associated with that, you take a little bit less out of your budget each year to, to produce operating costs or to spend on operating costs or maintenance costs. Typically, when we look at a school district, everybody can see that. We'll do a utility analysis on all of your buildings and we'll benchmark it against all the other school districts and buildings that we've done work on, just to give you a snapshot of where your schools are performing. And that gives us a basis of how we figure the guaranteed energy that we can get as a result of improving your building. This is just an example of some schools that we've done in the area. And for some of you, some of these Jim, you know a lot of these things, but some of these things here, like uh, ground source heat pump, which would be like geothermal, rooftop units, so we'll categorize that uh, because it's not fair to somebody has a system that's maybe not as advanced as another, and we can't go in and say, hey, you're wasting a lot of energy here if you've got a system that's just not you know, similar, so we'll benchmark it against other things that are available. Um, this is just a little trend analysis that I got off of the uh, ASBR DESI site. And it shows actually, the, uh, the green graph shows energy cost per student in Farmington District from, from 2007 through 2011. This is the state average, and it actually shows that you all improved in 2009, but you're actually running a little bit below the state average and saving 
energy cost per student. Now I must say that the overall average in Missouri isn't so great, so there's still probably a lot of room for improvement there, but it's just something that was public information that we thought we would bring to show you, give you an idea of where you are. Uh, this is a similar slide and your numbers are represented in the green. And this is energy costs as a percentage of your supplies. <coughs> if you all go through your budgets, you know that it's probably teacher salaries, and benefits, and some of those other things that are associated with cost and energy and utility bills simply come under the supplies category. So it's another statistic compared to the state average. And it looks like it was still a little bit below there at that one time in 07 08. I don't know what you all did in 09, but something probably to improve those figures. Um, There's a study that McGraw-Hill did on construction and some of the price increases that owners have been experiencing. 92% um, of them, of public owners, are experiencing price increases. Uh, year over year, they averaged 13%. And there's a little representation of what the increases were from 10 to 20 percent. And a lot of owners are seeking over the almost 60 percent side, but they were looking for ways to save money as these costs continue to increase on construction projects. Um, 40 percent said that they needed to shorten the construction cycle, so it, it seems kind of a Something that happens quite often in construction is not only is the price going up, these projects take longer and longer to, to complete because they become more complex. And 5% side plan reductions. Um, this is a study that was done by Penn, Penn State and Construction Industries Institute. 351 projects they took surveys on and cost performance contracting was 4.5% less than construction management and 6% less than design and build overall. This is a pretty important one to me. Is, again, construction speed or how much time it takes to do construction. So performance contracting was 7% and 12% faster than those other methods. Again, it's a project can be completed in a timeline very, very important for schools because you've got a short window of opportunity when the students are out for the summer. So we, we feel like this is an important thing that needs to be mentioned. <coughs> Delivery speed talks about not just the actual construction, but part of the design phase. And statistically, performance contract 23 and 33% faster. So again, you seem to be able to get a lot done under this method because there's just one entity involved in it typically. There's not a lot of finger pointing that can happen in, in the process. And the quality uh, exceeded at all levels, basically. Performance contracting was never a quality issue. Some of the benefits of doing it is that we do an innovative <coughs> team approach. We work with the architect, with your finance people, with local contractors. Uh, I think Scott could speak to that, but we've, we've worked with a lot of local subcontractors. Sometimes we've worked with a local general contractor like Paul uh, on projects that we do performance contracting on. So we really could come in and, and unify the project so it's one team working together to achieve the same goals. Uh, we work again with the architect. Um, the project is not based on just price only because we see an awful lot of projects that they get based on price and then we go in and do an energy audit on a project five, six years down the road and they find out that their newest building is costing them the most to operate because all they really thought about was getting that low cost at the beginning of the process. Um, and again, we have a guaranteed operating cost. Part of that savings uh, is ongoing. And the savings are measured and verified. We actually have some people in our company that their sole job is to check on all the projects that we've done over the years, take a look at the utility usage, 
make sure that they're meeting our guarantee because the last thing that Scott wants to do is have to write a shortfall check. Uh, the way that this works is that this guaranteed energy savings, let's say that we guarantee it, we do a million dollar project, the energy savings is guaranteed at $50,000 a year. Five, six years from now, we conduct an audit at the district request <coughs> And it's found that, that we only saved you forty thousand dollars in a particular calendar year. Then we're obligated by the statute to write a check for the difference. Now that goes on for fifteen years, you know, for the length of the contract. So at any time, if that energy savings doesn't come out, we're on the hook for it. Uh, I think we've never had to do a check yet, write a shortfall check, but it's just the way that the math works. Um, <laughs> probably the key things that I wanted to discuss tonight was that early, early on in the performance contract method, you all will know a price. When the RFP is issued and all the ESCOs respond to it, you're going to get a price, and that's the price up front before you begin anything else. You're going to know as a board, as an entity of the district, how much this project's going to cost. No change orders during the, the construction process. It's, that's just the way PC operates. Uh, we've been in business, I think, for over 12 years. We've never had a change order that wasn't asked of us by school district. So we've never gone to a district and said, hey, we need to charge you for a change order. In fact, I had a, a superintendent that used this method last year in Southwest Missouri, uh, Cassville, Missouri. And chose this method of construction because he had looked at all the projects that he had done either in-house or traditional methods and the spread between what the bids were received at and what he actually paid was a seven and a quarter percent spread over a three-year period. Now he was a small district um, that wasn't a lot of money but still seven percent is a lot of money between what told the project's going to be and what you actually pay. So that's one of the huge benefits, as I see, of performance contracting, is you know up front. Um, it's the fastest delivery method <coughs> out there. Um, and with performance contracting, all the accountability is with the performance contractor. Um, because we <coughs> basically take ownership of that whole project, we can't say, well, it was somebody else's fault that something didn't happen. It basically buck stops with us. And there's that 15-year relationship or commitment that we have to maintain that savings. So three minutes. And local contractors. We try to use as many local contractors as we can. Then three, three minutes. Okay. I'll uh, speed it up here. I went through your uh, list on Proposition Kids, some of the things that, that were on your list. And I just wanted to kind of briefly show some pictures. These are all projects that were done under performance contracting. Um, I'll kind of go through them sort of fast since I'm running out of time here. As you can see, it's a lot more than just energy saving. We can really do all forms of construction. I think when I looked at your list, the only thing we haven't done or that hasn't been done under performance contracting was tennis court resurfacing and a, a bus tracking system. <coughs> uh, but pretty much, or for the most part, all of the things that, that are on the Proposition Kids list have been done several times under performance contracting. And these are just some slides showing some of the stuff that, that have been done under that statute for that construction method. References. Um, get through these really fast. So I'm running out of time. But basically, what we would do under performance contract: discuss the needs and the goals of the district, um, publish an issue in RFP. It would be a competitive bid process where other ESCOs would come in, give you a number. Um, you receive and review all the proposals, take a selection. Not necessarily by the lowest price, but what you all feel is the best value and the best proposal that's put in front of you. Uh, it's fine-tuned and designed, budgeted, contracts approved, construction begins. And with 
that. I thank you, and I'll take any questions that you have. <laughs> Anything? Appreciate your. Yeah. I had much. Sure. You said several slides there about how much faster performance contracting is. How can you do that? A couple of reasons. Typically, we design in a very, very much quicker timeline because we're not basically on the clock for design work. We know that we have a limited window to get that done, and so we basically. I don't know, Scott. Do you have a. Yeah, the designing starts right up front. It's not a yeah. matter of waiting, you know, putting, getting prices put together and things of that nature. So when we would come in to kind of go through the buildings, the guys that would be coming in here would actually be the ones putting it together to about an 80% design. Yeah, and then we would use we had, we had architectural services or mechanical engineering services. <coughs> Um, are your are your your contractors are they already been picked by you or do you use local contractors or how do you I can't speak for all performance contractors but at least in our situation we always ask the school district for a list first um, some districts some areas I mean we, there was a project recently in Jefferson County and they had a pretty strong mandate there that they wanted a hundred percent local contractors and, I think we adhered to that with maybe a, a you know a rare exception. I mean, it, as long as it's in the best interest of the school district, we have a local contractor that comes in way higher than the guys that we have used in the past in other areas. We can certainly communicate that to you, make sure. Um, and we've had some instances where districts have recommended a local contractor of, of some sort, and after the project, they're like, "Well, we wish we wouldn't have used that particular." contractor and that happens um, but uh, they say that that part about working as a team we really work you know throughout the whole process as a team and um, you know again in my opinion and of course I'm biased because I'm in this business but to me sitting where you folks are you know that the fact that you've got that 15 year guarantee on the energy savings keeps a link to that contractor, whereas it's not a, you know, hey, we do this job and we move on to the next one. I mean, we have a philosophy customers for life. Once we do business with you, we want to continue and have a large percentage of people that we've done business with on multiple phases of projects. And it speaks highly to any, anybody in the construction business. We have to be customers doing something right. So, part. Vince, how are your costs, um, project-related costs, conveyed to the owner? Um, is it an open book process, or how do you guys generally work that? It, it can be, and I think it has been in some cases, but that's one of the other things. Is since it's not a fee-based, you know, we don't we don't charge a percentage over something, and so there's the incentive for us is we really have one bite at the apple. We have one chance to come before the board. Every ESCO in this RFP process has a chance to come in with the best project at a good price. <coughs> and if we don't get it, that's the end of the story and another other person gets it. So there's no incentive for us to raise the price up because it's not a percentage over the price of the project, if you will, um, as some methods can be. So it, it depends. Um, sometimes contingency fees are an open book and I think that we've uh, the state of Missouri required open book. Yeah. So they had a process that we had to follow. Some school districts require that, others we do a lump sum price. Right. Yeah, so we're we're very flexible. Yes, sir. I have two questions. First, how would you arrive at the price for your project, your overall project? Is it percentage based on, on the total? Uh, yeah, and, and I'll be straight up with you. I'm a salesperson, so I'm the pretty face that goes out, meets and greets, gets the relationships going. There's a number about five or six really smart guys in our company that are engineers and estimators. They're the ones that really put the nuts and bolts together, come up with this stuff. Um, if I, God forbid, if I was the one that was doing the pricing, we'd probably be out of business. <laughs> what it is basically, it's the sum of our subs, and then we have our overhead and our profit. 
fixed cost. It's a, it is a fixed cost. Yes. Okay, secondly, yes, sir. on a 15-year contract, that is only for the cost savings on energy. Correct. That's the only connection yes. you would have with the district. That had. What we typically do is we come to an agreement with the board or with the school district of what the uh, uh, operational savings and the maintenance savings will be, and we, we basically do an est best estimate on past experience, past projects that are similar. And that's just more or less an agreement that we come to, but that's not actually figured into the energy savings. The only thing by the law that you know that we can guarantee is the energy savings. But that's a great question. Um, yes, ma'am. In terms of the energy savings and quantifiable, at what point yeah. in the process is that determined? Is that typically so they can what we typically? It's a great question. Typically, we look at one one full year of utilities to base to get a base basis. And then once the project is complete, the new system will be in place. We start. We do another audit, a full calendar year after that the, the new things are put in place. And we come back with that audit result, show it to the district, and then the district says, "Okay, yeah, you say." <clears throat> we tend to be a little bit on the conservative side, and it's it's ironic because some of our competitors go in and they say, "Hey, well, we've written shortfall checks, and you know we're upfront about it." In our mind, that look, that makes it look like you didn't really design the project right because you didn't guarantee the amount. But that's you know that's just a difference between different performance contracting companies. So is that guaranteed savings determined at the same point when they're evaluating price for the project? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. When when the guaranteed price comes in, so is the annual the savings. savings. Okay. Um, and just as an example, I know that uh, we did a project in Cape Girardeau. Um, I think it was seven or eight years ago. We saved them twice what, what the guarantee amount was on their high school. It was just a few year old building and it was just burning energy like crazy. And they had another big construction project that they did a couple of years ago. And one of the board members of the CTS guys, you know, they supposedly guaranteed us, you know, $29,000 a year in energy savings. I think the first year savings got was like $71,000. So we went back and performed an audit, and we found out even six, seven years after the equipment was put in, with it, it getting a little old, um, we were still saving them like sixty-seven thousand dollars a year, and the guarantee was only you know, twenty-nine. So the board member was satisfied that we had, we had lived up to our part of the contract. But it's it's a nice uh, it's a, it's a nice uh, security blanket for for the school district to know that if energy talks ever get out of line, you have somebody to come to and that can answer that for you. And we have a very, very sharp uh, group of people that do that measurement and verification for us. And they're really good with the numbers. We had one young man, it was interesting, he uh, noticed that a school district that we did was falling way behind in their energy savings and found out that they had a wrestling coach that was keeping the gym at 85 degrees all winter. So the wrestlers were training and breathing hot air in. And we, we had to say, hey, wait a minute, you're operating this building way out of the spec that we that we wanted you to. And the superintendent put a stop to that. <coughs> the guy, hey, make him wear some sweaters instead. So, uh, thank you all very much for having us. And uh, see you again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm with CCS Group here with Alan Blair and Lloyd Poker from our office. Uh, 
I'll be talking kind of through the quick little presentation, but Alan and Lloyd will be available for any questions you all might have. We're here to talk about project management. Um, and, and what I first want to touch on is that during the design and construction process, owners have rights and responsibilities regardless of what project delivery method is chosen. Those rights and responsibilities must be effectively addressed in order to protect the owner's interests throughout the process. We believe that this is best handled by a construction professional with experience in the process who is either a district employee or an agent working for the district, not a contractor. A contractor has a different contractual relationship with an owner than an agent does. And the agent has a fiduciary duty to its, its principal. So uh, that's an important distinction. Um, there are three basic uh, uh, project delivery approaches. The conventional approach, which, which is the design, and then you bid it, and then you build it. Uh, in that approach, the owner holds a single contract with the architect and a single contract with the general contractor. <clears throat> in the mid-90s, the Missouri legislature approved a uh, or passed a statute that allows general contractors to perform construction management for public owners. In that process, the owner must hold all the contracts. The construction manager uh, is not allowed to guarantee anything except its own fee. And essentially, in the construction management process, the construction manager is public owner is outsourcing the supervision of the various uh, prime subcontractors to the construction manager. Um, and then the third process is the design build that Vince is uh, a version of which Vince has just talked about where the contractor is responsible for both the design and the construction. And I want to go through a little bit with the, the risks as we see them of the, of the three, three processes. <coughs> Under the conventional uh, process, one of the main risks that an owner has is making sure that everything that they have on their wish list or their needs list makes it into the design. And that's what the folks uh, from Bond Wolf will, will head up that process, making sure that they understand everything that you all are trying to accomplish with your, uh, with your process. Uh, and it's important to get those to, to make sure that that communication takes place effectively and everything gets in the documents. Uh, the next risk in, in the conventional uh, approach is the fact that the bidding documents must be effectively co coordinated. Um, they, if the electrical drawing shows light poles, uh, or if the civil drawing shows light poles going in a parking lot, the electrical drawing needs to show those same light poles <coughs> so that the, the, the electricity can be connected to it. And again, that's something that, that your design professionals can take care of, but that's a risk that the owner undertakes because during the construction process, if, the, if they haven't been coordinated, that contractor is going to look to the owner for, for compensation for that because they don't have a contract with the designer. Um, the third major risk that I see, and, and one of the things I haven't mentioned is uh, CCS Group does a lot of, in addition to doing project management, we do dispute resolution services for people who have gotten into some sort of a, a dispute or an argument construction process and what and I do a lot of that work and what what I see a lot of times is that when construction contracts are not fairly administered uh, and they're, they, uh, some lawyer tries to make them one-sided you're more apt to end up with a with a dispute or a problem that, that again falls to the owner that, that needs to be taken <coughs> um, so those are the those are the main risks of the conventional design, and, and they're all pretty manageable, particularly with a good design professional on board and a good project manager on board. <clears throat> Construction management has a whole different set of risks. In addition to the first two elements of the design <coughs> and the bidding documents, uh, because the owner has to hold contracts with each of the prime subcontractors, if they get into a dispute about who has that in their price, and both of them say they don't have it in their price, the owner's going to be left holding the bag, figuring out who's going to pay for that. And they're either going to tell one of the contractors to pay for it, potentially get a claim back, or uh, they're going to have to uh, write a change order for it. 
um, there's a risk of uh, default by any of those contractors. Anytime you have all those, those contracts out there, if one of those contractors defaults, uh, you're going to have to go to a bonding company to get them to pick up the, uh, the, the slack uh, for that contractor. It's a very time-consuming process, usually delays the project significantly anytime a contractor defaults. Um, you risk schedule delays. If one of the prime contractors doesn't perform, it delays the other prime contractors. Those, prime con the, the, those that have been delayed will come to the owner looking for compensation for that. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things we'd like to point out is that uh, as a public entity, any contract that the district enters into over a certain amount of money, which I don't know exactly what it is, must be backed up by a payment and performance bond. And so each of these prime subcontractors who would be bidding to, uh, to the project uh, would have to provide a payment and performance bond. That precludes some of your smaller contractors, who may be very well qualified local contractors, uh, from, from bidding on the work because they may not have that bonding capacity. Whereas if they're working for a general contractor, in all likelihood the general contractor is the only one who has to provide a bond and, and they can end up doing that work. In summary, on the, as a construction management approach, the owner basically assumes the role of the general contractor. Uh, they delegate supervision of the contractors to the CM. And if the CM does a good job, things can go okay. If the CM falters, the owner is going to have some, some issues to deal with. On the design build, the main risk that, that we see in the design build process is that all of the owner's input has to be made up front. Um, I, I have been a developer and owner and design build was an option open to me, but it was not particularly attractive to me because I wanted to make sure that I got all of my input into the design. And depending on how much design is completed uh, by the owner up front to what you to what you tell the design build bidders that you want, uh, unforeseen scope and quality issues can arise. Uh, if you don't get all that design in, if, it, if it's not specified in your design basis, uh, it's, it's unlikely that the contractor is going to offer to do something more expensive than that design basis would allow him to do. So that's a very risky uh, option in, in our opinion. Without adequate oversight, uh, design build can have a higher cost and a lower quality. And it's something you really need to pay attention to. And, and uh, as Vince mentioned, performance contracting is a form of design build. Um, two project management per se. Major corporations and some large school districts have a full-time project management staff. Most school districts don't because they don't do enough construction. Um, without that qualified project management staff, we suggest that uh, an agent of the owner project manager can fill that role. What is it that a project manager does? Uh, prior to the you know, pre-design, uh, they need to really get themselves familiar with what the uh, objectives and, and uh, goals of the owner are, uh, scope, cost, quality, and schedule. Um, if, if the project manager is on board before the architect is hired, they can help communicate the project executive objectives to the architects in an RFQ proposal. <coughs> Um, they can assist in preparation uh, of the AE contract. They can provide conceptual budgeting for allocation of proposed bond issue funds. You all have a, a great document here that, that really sets all that out. Uh, and, and that's the kind of, kind of work that a project manager could do as well. Um, and maybe most importantly, setting out a design and, constru and construction logistics plan for the overall project. Uh, a day lost in design is the same as a day lost the day before you're going to open a school. Every day counts the same. And knowing what it's going to take to achieve all of your objectives is really critical. And that's where the project manager should be doing its job. During the design phase, uh, the project manager ought to be collaborating with the owner and the design team to, to develop a design schedule that, that, that meets uh, the owner's objectives. Uh, typically, the project manager uh, would, would be providing uh, 
budget estimates at each phase of the design, knowing how much, in order for an owner to make good cost-effective decisions, they need to know where they stand from a budget standpoint. Can we afford to put that wood paneling in? Do we want to put that wood paneling in? We're working on a, a on a project right now where, where the, the, the designer put in wood paneling that was going to cost $150 per square foot. Uh, those kinds of things need to be known so that, that good, effective decisions can be made. Um, and then value engineering is tossed around a lot, and a lot of people talk about value engineering something out of the, the plans at the end of the project. That's not value engineering. That's hatchet work on the scope. The only way you can value engineer anything out after the construction documents are done is to take scope out. Value engineering needs to take place collaboratively with the design team during the early phases of the design. That's when you have your, your major impact on cost without affecting your, your, your final quality. During the construction <coughs> documents phase, uh, collaborate with the owner and the design team on constructability. That is often used together with value engineering. Constructability is how those construction documents go together and make it as cost effective as possible to construct the, the end product. And, and, and that work uh, can be done again collaboratively during the uh, construction document phase. Uh, the project manager would typically collaborate with the design professionals uh, to develop the front end documents, the business terms and conditions of the specifications. <coughs> uh, what does that schedule need to be? How much time are you going to give the contractor? Uh, you don't want to tell the contractor, if, you, if you're planning on holding classes on August 15th, you don't want to tell the contractor he's got until August 14th to get the project done. All of that stuff needs to be thought through and the owner's goals and objectives uh, dealt with. Um, communicating with the uh, municipal and regulatory agencies during the construction document phase, mm -hmm. the, towards the end of it and in uh, into uh, the bidding phase allows the project to proceed smoothly while uh, without holdups by the regulatory agencies. <clears throat> Down here, you may not have the, the same problems we do up in the St. Louis area, the Metropolitan Sewer District, and some other regulatory agencies who can take what seems like eons to, uh, uh, to approve something. Uh, but you need to get, get at that early and, and uh, work collaboratively with the design professionals to do that. Uh, during the bidding phase, we, uh, the project manager would develop the language for the RFP, uh, solicit interest from the bidding community, collaborate with the design team uh, to field the questions that the uh, bidding contractors are going to have as, as uh, uh, they bid the work, and then document those answers so that all of the, uh, all of the bidders are bidding the same thing. Uh, issuing addenda with, you know, in conjunction with the design team. Coordinating the bid opening for the owner. As an owner, you want to open these bids publicly. Uh, the project manager should assist you in the development of the construction contract. Should final negotiate the construction <coughs> contract. Um, develop uh, communication forms and, and processes to maximize control of cost, quality, and schedule. Those are the big three uh, right behind safety. And as, as uh, Chuck mentioned early, uh, making sure that the contractor has uh, a really effective safety program is in everybody's best interest as well. Um, <clears throat> change happens on construction projects. Uh, it can be because somebody didn't think of something. It can be because there's an error in the construction documents. It can be because nobody, you know, something happened underground that nobody foresaw. Managing that change is key uh, to maintaining budgets uh, for the owner. And that's something that your, your project manager should be doing for you. Managing the schedule is key. Uh, simply turning the project over to a general contractor and saying, give me a schedule that shows me that you're going to get this done, it, we find ineffective. And we suggest that the owner take a very proactive role in working with the contractor to manage the schedule. Administering the construction contract, uh, making sure that everybody is performing in accordance with the terms and conditions of their contract is another thing that the project manager should be responsible for. 
managing the payment process to make sure that the, the, the process is, is done uh, on a timely basis, is done fairly, <coughs> yet protects the owner's interest to make sure that the owner doesn't overpay uh, at some point during the project. Uh, okay. um, why do I need a project manager? This is my last slide. <coughs> there are no do-overs in design and construction. You only get one chance to get it right, and if any big things happen, uh, you're going to have problems. They can be very expensive. It's not a place for on-the-job training. Uh, and lastly, an effective project manager will save you money at the bottom line, even after considering his fees. Uh, and the, the only point I'll make here, don't hire a project manager to wear two hats. Make sure that the project manager that you hire is representing only your interests as the board and the district. So that's our uh, canned presentation. Uh, can we answer any questions for anybody? I'd like to ask one. On this $17 million bond issue and you're the uh, project manager, what kind of what kind of fees or would you be charging to oversee this? A little bit of a loaded question, uh, but I'll go back to my uh, my last slide, and that is that I'll guarantee you that, that you shouldn't hire us or any other project manager if you think those fees are going to increase your bottom line cost. Your bottom line cost will be decreased because you've hired an effective project manager, whether that's an agent like us, or whether that's an employee of the district, somebody needs to be managing your interest during this process. And simply foregoing that isn't, isn't a way to save money. In fact, uh, we think we can, we can hook you up with as many owners as you want who have been through this process, so we'll tell you that it did save money. Can the answer to your question yeah. is in the 2 to 3% range. I mean, I, I went both. I, mean, I know they've never, the school district has never had a project manager before that I know of. And that's I, I can tell you one other, in, in a supplement that Greg just said. We never ever price our work as a percentage of construction because it isn't in the district's best interest. <clears throat> Frankly, it isn't in our best interest. We, we will look at the scope and nature and schedule of the projects that you want to undertake and propose a fee based upon the needs that your district has. And if we work against a not to exceed price, um, more often than not, our fees come in well under what we project at the start of the project. More often than not, we also end up doing additional projects for our clients that they feel we've been effective, we've been helpful, we've helped save money on their prior projects, <coughs> we've helped with these things as well, and we do, and we still bring it. Well, the only reason I asked that question, I mean, there was, I mean, you you're setting a budget to do, and this would be something that had to be put in you know, your budget if this is what your you know, district is going to go by. You know, and I, yep. I'm just kind of curious of what kind of <coughs> money you'd be looking, you're looking at. So, and that that fee includes all of the time we spend. That's not two or three percent profit. Right. That is all of our time, and and we, you know, we bill for our services basically based on the effort that's going to be required. As Alan said, not some percentage of the of the project. Any other questions? Craig, well, <clears throat> one thing that um, site logistics could be a real issue in this project. Um, how do you guys work through that? Generally we would start working with uh, probably Jim and yourself and, and uh, sit down and look at what all of these things are going to, things that have to be done and what they're going to need. And we would put together a preliminary logistics plan schedule that would end up going into the front end documents of, of your bids. Uh, you don't want to leave anything up to the contractors to decide how they're going to go about executing their work if it can have an impact on the school district's operations. So we work very closely uh, with the entire project team 
to make sure that the, the, the district's uh, objectives are, are taken care of, uh, including where is the trailer going to sit, where, where are we going to allow construction access, where is the construction fence going to go. All of those kinds of things need to be looked at early on in, in, the, in the project and should be in the bid documents themselves. Just, just to add to that, just to give you an example, um, just completed work last uh, year before last, started in 2010 out at St. James. Um, they had all open corridors between their classrooms, and part of the project was enclosing all of those corridors. It was a huge logistic nightmare for the district. They didn't know how to handle it. We met with the contractor. We met with the, we had the fire department there. Uh, we had the police department there. We had everybody there together collectively and defined what would be emergency access routes through construction. And then we maintained those emergency access continually through the entire construction process. When things got completed, then we had another coordination meeting with all of these entities involved so that as we went to the next section and how, you know, so when the fire, if the firemen pulled up to the job, they knew how to get through the construction site, they knew how to get children in and out. This was an elementary school and everything worked out extremely well, but the district per se just didn't know how to, you know, how to handle that. What we did, much of this was put in the contract, in the bid documents up front so that all of the contractors knew this was how they had to bid the work. This was what was going to be enforced. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I got one more question. Do you have anybody uh, that lives in the Farmington School District that works for you, or do you work on any schools? in the area, uh, in the surrounding counties? In the surrounding counties, Mr. Poker is a lifelong Jefferson County resident. Uh, he's done work uh, down in, in Jefferson R7. Uh, North County. North County School District. Oh. So we're, uh, we're very familiar with the, with the general area. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Outline that we're going to have on up on the screen is similar to I think what was passed out in the board packet. So this is just nothing that you don't have in your board packet. <coughs> yeah, just go ahead. <coughs> uh, like I said, Paul Brockmiller. I'm with Brockmiller Construction, and we're here to talk about general construction. So that's really not even pertinent. So. More or less, it's an education process. Uh, talking about general construction, and I don't care which of these performance contracting, construction management, what you're talking about, what you're going to be talking about is individuals. You can have the best company, but if they don't have the right individual running that job, it's not going to reflect on the, the quality of the project they're trying to deliver. So that's one of the things to keep in mind when you're talking as I go through on this. Being a school district, you're going to be under the Missouri State statute for bidding process. If you're an owner, you can go out and hire your general contractor up front. You are regulated by having to go through a bidding process. Um, and in doing so, the method that's used a lot of times is the general construction method. One of the keys to the general construction method is you're able to get input into this job up front. When you put out a set of bidding documents, you know exactly what you are getting. And you're going to be having input influence sitting down with the architect being able to make sure that your needs are met. Now when those documents are put out, you'll put this out and then you'll solicit bids coming in and you'll be able to open these bids up to see what are your lowest bids. So at that point in time, instead of just having an upfront vague number, you're able to get detailed firm numbers that you'll be able to write a contract on based upon the set of documents that you put out. 
to saying exactly what you want. So rather than we want a school building, okay, it's going to be this amount, but you aren't quite sure what you're getting in there. You're going to know what you're getting because you provided the documents with the assistance of the architect in getting that material. So when you open the bids, you're going to be able to look and see what the lowest bid is. You know, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. The lowest bid, a lot of times, is not your best bid. But at least you can see what is out there, and you know where those numbers are, so you know how they stack up. Single source responsibility. When you're running a job, as I mentioned, people. The job site superintendent is the most important person <coughs> on that job. He's the one there coordinating the day-to-day -day activities, the one that's going to be responsible for the construction schedule, the quality of construction, and coordinating all activities involved on that job. By doing the general construction, you have that one single point of contact that's at the job site every single day. And then also, when the job is complete, if you have a warranty issue, you can make that one phone call. It's that general contractor's responsibility to follow up and make sure that any of those items are completed under warranty. And warranty is going to happen. Things are going to break. It's just a part of it to making sure that you have one person you can contact to make sure that that happens. By doing it this way, you have one contractor that's responsible for getting all of the subcontractors together. When he is putting together his bid, he's responsible for going out, soliciting bids, getting the bids coming in, and putting together his best numbers. I'm going to talk about that. What is the best number here just a little bit? Uh, it was mentioned earlier, the ability to incorporate more local participation. By doing the general construction method, there's lots of contractors in this area that we work with all the time that are more than qualified, yet if they have to go out, as Craig mentioned, by the, the state law mandating having to provide performance and payment bonds, they're not able to. They just don't do it that often. Uh, getting performance and payment bond uh, usually takes an annual audit of your uh, uh, accounting records and everything, and they're just, there's just not a big need for it. So. If you're going to have all the subs directly do it, you're going to probably keep quite a bit of local participation out. In the highest quality, uh, the general contractor is one person there. I feel that they're going to take responsibility for that project. They're going to take ownership for that project. That they're, It's their reputation. Uh, when you work on, uh, I've always said this with school district administrators, you can't ever afford, especially in this area, to not do well on one job because when administrators get together they all talk and they know the good and the bad about whether it be construction or other things that go in the school districts. So I feel you're going to get a, the highest quality there. Okay, what's going to make a successful project? And some of this, Craig, I think stole some of my notes on it, so <laughs> you've heard some of this already. <coughs> reason I went first. <laughs> the most important thing about the project is you. Working with your architect to make sure you know what you are getting on it. And to make sure you tell him what you're getting and then to understand it. Sit down with those drawings. Be aware of where am I getting outlets? Am I getting smart boards? What type of casework am I getting? You, that's what, you have to be the one to tell the contractor what you want. If you provide a set of documents, uh, then, and then you know the contractor bids it, yet all of a sudden something comes out. Well, I didn't know. Well, you're you should told the architect, so that's what you know we were bidding. It's, we don't know what your thinking is, what your concepts are, and in doing that, providing quality documents. When people always get this misconception, change orders. Well. A good set of documents is going to keep change orders from happening. If there's nothing for a contractor to claim, well, that's not shown on the drawings, he can't make that change order claim. Now, with that being said, we're all human. There's no way we can build a perfect set of drawing or building. Architect can design <coughs> a perfect building, and you, the owner, aren't going to get done saying, oh, I wish I'd done something differently. Well, I always equate it to a triangle, and somewhere within that triangle, we all come together and we operate as a team on it. And that's what's important on for a successful project. 
Now the other thing is, I've mentioned before, okay, low bid. When you get the low bid, too many owners out there say, well, that's the low bid. We've got to use that right away. That's, we've got to use that one. Low bid. We can't, we can't pass up the dollars on it. Biggest mistake you're going to make a lot of times. A lot of times, the low bid is a good bid. But there's a lot of the circumstances out there where it's not. What's going to, what's going to make a low bid not good? Well, if the contractor, he missed something on it. We bid a job one time. A guy missed the entire second floor. Yeah, he still, he still wanted to try to do that job. Now, what would have happened to the owner when you're using a bid that's that low? Something in the end is going to come out. What is the contractor's reputation? Can they, are they able to perform? What is their quality in the past? What is their dispute resolution? Are they going to be looking for change orders? Uh, there was a contractor that just went out of business, better in St. Louis. His philosophy on bidding it, it was known within the industry, he was going to, on bid day, he was going to go to his hard cost, he was going to bid the job below cost. Then he was going to shop all his numbers around, completely unethical, and then he was going to try to make his profit up on change orders. That's the reputation the guy had. Now there's an auction for his equipment, but if the owner doesn't know to ask those questions, he's not going to low, no, he's going to look at the low number. The quality of uh, the superintendent, most important man on the job. That's another successful way. Find out who will be running that job, what are his references on that. Quality of the subcontractors. Another big question to ask, how much of the work will a general contractor self-perform? There's some general contractors out there, they're nothing but they take numbers, they just manage. Don't self-perform anything, really aren't taking a lot of ownership of that job. They're nothing but paperwork pushers. Find out how much the general contractor is going to self-perform, but then find out the quality of his subcontractors. Even your best general contractors are, are going to perform no more than probably 40% of the work themselves. There's going to be the electrician, the plumber, uh, the, the painter, the drywaller, the flooring guy. All those are subcontractors. There's not me. There's just general contractors don't do it. You have people that specialize in that one. You need those specialty contractors. But then find out who are the general subcontractors. Uh, there was a job uh, we've been not too long ago. We warned the owner up front. Please look at your electrician. The gentleman's not qualified. He's already has prevailing wage violations. Well, he went under on the job. General contractor had to end up paying it. There are large prevailing wage violations. Who's going to benefit from that? Uh, we bid another job that. There was a roofing contractor that never bid a job before, wasn't even certified, yet the other contractor used them. Uh, find out who you're, what are the quality they're going to do. Because even though the general, you told your contract the general contractor, he might get that job done, doing the best he can, but what is the quality you're truly getting? Uh, so the subcontractors are a huge uh, part of it. In addition to your suppliers, the quality of sub suppliers, making sure you're getting the, the products you want on it. Uh, then represent, representation during construction. Craig talked about this. <clears throat> the school district needs somebody to represent them that knows about construction. They can ask the questions. They can look out for your best interests on it. Uh, Vic, when you're <laughs> evaluating these, you can get a reference letter. Not many people are going to send out a reference letter with a bad reference on it. It's someone's responsibility to get into it and truly find out who these people are. During construction, they can be look, walking through that construction project to make sure architect can't be there all the time, to make sure that they're getting everything every day. Even when you pick that good contractor, there's things that happen sometimes. There's oversight. Just someone, another set of eyes on it. And then a fair decision maker. So nothing is worse from a contractor on a job. But when you hit, there is a glitch on the drawings. We're going 100 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden something's not coordinated on the drawings. We don't get an answer. We need someone to step in on the owner's behalf and say, this is what we want, let's move on with it. Let's keep this job going. We can't afford to wait five days to get a decision like this last winter. We couldn't have had a better winter. We needed to take advantage of every day. If we would have had a, uh, something that needed a decision, we would have been waiting. That's time lost. Okay, what, what are the potential problems? We talked about the quality of your contractor. Not getting a good general contractor. It can make your life terrible, the entire job. 
and you're going to be paying for it not up, just up front, you're going to be paying for it for years. One of the best compliments we ever received was uh, uh, another school district that uh, we finished second on. Uh, and the owner told us later on, we were already on site doing a large commercial job. We finished second on the next bid that came out. When we got done with our job, the owner said, you know, I want to compliment you guys when you had the two jobs side by side. They had a lower number than you did. But that money we thought we were saving up front by going with that low bidder, between having to pay numerous change orders and the job running almost a year behind schedule, that money, we blew through that money. They said it was a big mistake. It didn't get us a job, but it was a great compliment. And we made a, an owner a great reference in the future on it. Uh, potential, not having the right subcontractors on it. Uh, your exposure uh, to change orders. If you don't have a good set of documents, you're setting yourself up for a change order. I mean, you can't expect a contractor to bid a solid surface top yet you don't show that on the drawings. Uh, you know, just the nature of the beast, if you're going to be try to be a, a competitive contractor, you're not just going to throw the highest quality at it when you're relying upon the documents to tell what needs to be there. Uh, and then if you don't understand the drawings and you don't have someone <coughs> representing you that understands the drawings, you're going to get done and say, well, hold on, I didn't realize I was, we were getting this. So you didn't get what, what was expected because you didn't understand. Um, so really that's education on general construction. It's, I'm not going to sit here and say one means is better than the other. It depends on what you're looking for, what your needs are, how you're wanting to put it together. I do think, though, that the school district really needs someone to look after their best interest no matter which way you go, because that's going to be uh, uh, one of the things I've seen here tonight. I've seen uh, some questions. I haven't seen a whole lot of questions from behind the table, and that's where someone over here needs to make sure you guys are fully understanding and they can communicate that to you. So any questions? Yes, ma'am. It's not coincidence I've had this question, but um, we were talking about uh, quality of work from subcontractors. Would uh, the subcontractors that are um, getting workers, would they use uh, union workers from our local area? That depends on the general contractor. Like I said, I'm, I'm talking general construction, mm -hmm. not, not me as a firm right now. Predominantly, this area has been uh, a more unionized workforce. I'm not going to say if they're having, they're, 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 it's, it's not a mixed, it's not a 100% union workforce. It depends on who you're going to get. Uh, I will say this, union people talking earlier, uh, we have seen bid documents before stating, you know, uh, the amount of training programs you want to make sure you're getting trained workers. That's we've seen in bid documents before. Uh, you know, same ways we mentioned with Craig or one of the other gentlemen earlier about, you know, how much local participation do we want. We've seen the same thing with not saying union per se, but the training of it, which in my opinion makes a, a big difference, making sure you get that quality worker. Yes? Uh, Paul, I have a question on general contractors and subcontractors. Would they all be required to pay prevailing wage? State law, yes. State law. And that's, and that's, one thing, another thing to ask your general contractor, how do they make sure that they're uh, having to pay uh, prevailing wage? With the pay requests that are turned in each time, there's, there's a, a certified prevailing wage form. It's a, uh, you know, if you forge it, that's a felony. So the contractor, he's the one who's res ultimately responsible for it, making, having somebody check those prevailing wage forms <coughs> to make sure that they're, they're being filled out properly. And then, like I said, then there's also a second uh, pair of eyes. Uh, when we have worked uh, with the program manager before, they call it before, hey, let's, let's check this rate here. Let's make sure something's not right. Or maybe our misunderstanding or another uh, understanding from the sub, just making sure that that is addressed that way. And yes, that is, that is state law. Mr. Yes. I just want to say, don't mistake our quietness and our lack of questions for not knowing. We've been supplied all these papers and we've I, done our research. So whenever other I'm just, I'm just saying, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of times, 
it's a full-time job overseeing these construction projects. I mean, don't get me wrong that you're not knowledgeable, but you have other jobs, responsibilities, uh, <coughs> trying to look after a construction project, especially when you're going to be doing a construction project that's multiple phases. And we're not just you're not just talking about building a building. You're talking about a building, roofs, fire alarms. Uh, it's it's a huge task. I would like to go back to the question about <coughs> the unions. <coughs> we have, in the past building projects here, have always strived and tried to use union workers. I mean, you can attest to that, that, that we have done that. Um, and and that, that's important. And as we had visited with the various trades, uh, unions, we, we had stressed to them and got their support for that in the past. That we wanted to do that, and I think we I think we've done that basically. And I think they have uh, given the the district. I know, uh, in going out to their members, they've been highly uh, they've encouraged their members to vote for the propositions the school district has put forth. And one more thing, you, you go home in this community, okay? And Bill Geesing, and and you have worked with project managers and actually have worked as a project manager yourself at one time and you've also been exposed to performance contracting. What are your thoughts? For Farmington, Missouri. <clears throat> For Farmington, Missouri. What Craig's method of construction, we're not competing entities. He provides a service that gets involved more up front. If you were a private individual, you could get a general contractor involved up front and go through all of that one. You're not. You're a public <coughs> entity. You can't do that. That's where, if you're asking me if I were in your shoes, I think you need to seriously look at someone like this that can sit down with you, working with the architect up front, coordinating those issues, making sure you understand, <coughs> assisting the architect with cost estimating, someone that might be just a little bit more knowledgeable of it, has had their hands in the fields a little bit more, and then during the construction project <coughs> represents the school district. And then you go out and you hire a good general contractor. If you're asking my opinion, that's that's the way I would perceive of it. Now, Jeff, you asked a question before. You asked, then the perception is, okay, so are we adding another layer of costs onto this? As Craig said, if you you're saving that money up front, making sure you're getting, uh, you aren't overpaying. No, I don't think you are layering a thing on. Plus, you're insuring you're, you're going to get a better lifetime job, not just something you're going to get on your bid opening day, but 20 years from now when you're talking about this project, okay, we might have paid $5,000 more to go to a, a higher grade roof, someone who can then lend a little bit more uh, credence to that right now. If I can piggyback on that, my recommendation would be put the responsibility in the hands of the experts. General contractors' expertise is building construction. You know, we don't get involved in energy systems, the efficiency of those systems, which is the right system to put in. But through the design build process, you're going to hire an architect and an engineer that does understand those things, and they know what the most efficient systems are and they've taken your design intent and they've incorporated that based upon how you want to allocate your priorities. Your priority may not be to have the most efficient building at the expense of less square footage, less amenities or features. You give the design intent to your architect, he's the expert in how to bring those design elements together. And he'll work with the expertise of that engineer to find out the right systems it's going to get you that balance of how much do I want in my energy efficiency versus how much do I want in the design and configuration or the look and appearance of the building and then you turn over the actual construction to the expert who is the general contractor and that's their expertise okay well thank you guys very much thank you I want to thank everyone that came this and come back over the board.
And I would like to thank everybody who's involved in this night. Um, always appreciate the community's involvement in this process. So with that, I entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session. I move to adjourn to closed session for uh, discussion of personnel pursuant to 610.021, sections 3 and 13. A second. A second. Diana. Yes. Bates. Yes. Mary. Yes. Davis. Yes. Vaughn. Yes. 